Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. How many of you don't want to live a life of deception? Amen. And one of the first scriptures that the Holy Spirit showed me when I started studying the word was, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Amen? So, I, I'm pretty big about knowing why I'm doing things and trying to, you know, praying to God, you know, if I'm, if I'm, doing this great thing that's going to impress people, but I got a stinky heart, please show me. I, don't, I want everything to be right. Because the Bible says that whatever we do with impure motives, we're not going to get a reward for it. It's going to be burned up in the fire. So if, if I pray to be seen, it does me no good. If I, I can have all kinds of gifts and do all kinds of fancy things, but if I have no love, then all I am is a big noise and a clanging cymbal. Uh, I can... Give and give, but if I do it to be well thought of, then that's not good. So it, God is not nearly as concerned about what we're doing as he is why we're doing it. Can anybody say amen? amen. Yeah. So let's just give an example. We'll pretend for a minute like this is not me, although it was. <laughs> a younger and a very excited believer shares with me a verse of scripture that God is revealing to her. And she's forgotten where it's at in her Bible, but she knows it really well, well. And she's sharing with me all that God is showing her. And I assure her that I am aware of all that. And then I'm kind enough to give her the chapter and verse that I know that she doesn't know. You say, well, what's the problem? Well, then comes God. Well, Joyce, out of spiritual pride, you had to let her know that she wasn't really teaching you anything that you did not already know. And you wanted to impress her with your knowledge of where the scripture might be found. In doing so, you've dampened her enthusiasm instead of simply listening to her and being excited for her. The moment that I assured her that I already knew that, oh yeah, yeah, I've known that for a long time, yeah, that's, I, I teach that. That, that's always a good one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I've been teaching that for years. Amen. <laughs> you, can, you can almost feel the, the whole atmosphere kind of make a shift when that person now is shut down and they're, they're losing their enthusiasm. It'd be just like if somebody met with uh, a more mature Christian and they were so excited. Oh, man, I tell you what, I'm having such great fellowship with God. I, I got up this morning and, and the first five minutes I was up, I just prayed and worshiped God. And Sister Super Christian looks at him and says, five minutes? <laughs> that's, that's all you prayed was five minutes? Well, yeah, how long do you pray? <laughs> oh, the first, first four hours every day. Yeah, I pray. And I've met people like that. But here's the thing. <laughs> it is so important to me that we really love God truly. I mean, really love God with our whole heart and that we're not just playing a bunch of religious games. Amen? And that we're not just one way on Sunday and another whole way the rest of the week. And I lived like that for so long. And even something little like this. I want to get to the point where I'm humble enough if somebody that's been saved a week wants to spend 30 minutes telling me about something that I've known for 20 years that I don't have to try to tell them how much I know, but I can be happy to just let them be excited. Amen? But I still got a ways to go. But, you know, here's the good thing. I recognized it. So the good news is I'm not deceived anymore. 
Now I'm just left with it. Well, there you have it. <laughs> Can't hide from that anymore. Okay, well, I love to give. And uh, I mean, I really do just love to give. It's one of the gifts that God has given me. And considering how stingy I used to be, that's pretty good. <laughs> and um, so at the end of the year, I got this idea. I thought about a couple of people I know and knew, and I thought, you know, I'm going to give them a gift on the last day of the year, and I'm going to give them a gift on the first day of the year so I can go out giving and come in giving. Well, that, I mean, that sounds good, doesn't it? But then over the next two days while I was planning, God began to make me aware that I was also thinking about how good they were going to think I was. Oh, don't act like that. Oh, <laughs> Oh, oh, poor Joyce, oh. <laughs> oh, she's so, she's, that's so sad. I don't know if I can listen to her. <laughs> and I finally just got aggravated with myself and I said, I'm not gonna do it. If I cannot do it with the right motive, then I'm not doing it. I'm not going to do stuff just so somebody else can think that I'm good. So maybe my next year I can do it for the right reason, but I didn't do it this year because I want my life to be right before God. I want my heart to be right before God. Now, here's another thing I'm going to tell you, and I've, I was going to tell you this, and then I actually, you can see I crossed it off because I thought, no, I better not tell them that. Okay, I mean, this even sounds bad to me. Okay, listen. <laughs> but I just feel like if I'm truthful with you, and, and see, the good news is, is I don't feel condemned about any of it. I don't feel guilty. I don't feel condemned. I don't think God's mad at me because here's what I think. I think that God loves it when we face truth. <laughs> to me, that's the important thing. Because if I'm willing to face truth, then I can grow. But if I'm not willing to face truth, I'm stuck in a mess that I'm going to have forever. All right, now. <laughs> okay. My mom, my dad, and my widowed aunt all came to a point in their life at the same time when they needed care. And so first it was take care of them in their houses, get the groceries, get the lawn cut, get the house cleaned, you know, do all that. Now, keeping in mind, I'm running a worldwide ministry, so it's not like I'm looking for something to do, okay? <laughs> but I'm very aware that if I stand up here and do this, and behind the scenes, I don't do that. Hello? Hello? that then is just a bunch of phony baloney because that is my God-given duty before God, okay? Now, I'm gonna throw in right here that I didn't wanna do any of it. Didn't want to, didn't enjoy it, but I did it. Well, then eventually they moved to assisted care living, by the way, which we paid for all of. So you haven't had any fun to you paying for three people to do that. And we have a lot of longevity in my family. So <laughs> I'm just making a point here that it, it was a long time, all right? And I mean, like my grandfather lived to be 102, so there's no telling how long I'll be around, amen? <laughs> I mean, I, I just want you to get this because here's the thing, a lot of you are dealing with stuff in your life that's not very pleasant. And you got to understand that none of it has to keep you from being a Christian and acting like one. And the only way that we're ever going to have victory as a Christian is if we learn to do things we don't want to do with a good attitude. Amen. And in order to do that, we've got to first of all be honest with God, God, I don't want to do this. I do not want to do this, but I'm asking you for the grace to help me do it and to do it with a good attitude. So finally wore out assisted living, got to the point where couldn't do that anymore. And so my dad went to the nursing home first and then 
he passed away. And, you know, you got to keep in mind that my dad sexually abused me. My mother abandoned me into the situation. So I'm dealing here with people that I don't, you know, have any gooey, ooey feelings for. Did not. No unforgiveness. Forgave them. Was committed to taking care of them. But, you know, you can forgive somebody for something they've done to you. And that doesn't mean you're going to have all these woohoo feelings every time you get around them. And, you know, as I went back and forth about, should I tell you this, shouldn't I tell you this, should I tell you, shouldn't I tell you, I just think that there's a lot of people, as Christians, they deal with this kind of stuff all the time, but they never would want to tell anybody how they felt because they think it's just, it's not awful, it's normal. So, then my mom went in the nursing home. Well, my mother was a sweet lady but she had mental illness. And you just really haven't done anything challenging until you, I mean, it's much easier to take care of somebody that has physical illness than somebody that has mental illness. And she was, um, oh, I forget all the fancy words for it, but she, she would see things that weren't there and thought she had bugs in her food when she didn't and, you know, would see just different things. Or you might go, I might go on a day and, you know, maybe it's my only day in town that week. And I... Want to go do this? <laughs> no, it's right. I mean, I don't want to go, but I want to go. You know what I mean? It's like, I know I should go. It's the right thing to do, and I'm committed to doing my duty before God, but I'm like, oh, God, help me go do this with a good attitude. <laughs> so, and, and the reason why I'm telling you all this is this, because I dare not think that I'm good because I go. This is where we get in trouble. Somebody said to Jesus, good master. And he said, why are you calling me good? There's none good but God. Now, he said that in his humanity. In his humanity, he was saying, I'm not good. Only God is good. So the thing that we have to understand is as we grow in God, any good thing that we see happen through us, it's not because we're good, because we're never going to reach the status of good. I mean, we're just not good. God is good. And we get to be the vehicle for his goodness to flow through. But when we start taking the credit, now we've got a self-deception problem because we think, oh, I'm good, when really there's no one good but God. God yeah, maybe some of you aren't ready for this, but this is where we're going today anyway. And... Uh, here I'm dealing with this person who never did anything for me. <laughs> oh, no, God, I can't think like that. Thank you. <laughs> Is anybody home? <laughs> I'm telling you what real life with God is like. Now, do I have to think I'm a bad person? No, I already know without Jesus that I am. <laughs> so there's no pretending about that. Without you, Jesus, I Absolutely nothing, zero, zippo, nothing. But I marvel that God has given me the grace for now probably, I don't know, 15, close to 20 years to do this week in and week out or every other week and go and go and go and go and do it and do it and do it. And I'm not doing it because I'm good. I've already told you I don't even want to do it. But I'm doing it because I love God and because it is my duty and, wait a minute, and because it is the right thing to do. Whatever made us think that we have to like something to do what's right. So there we go. I crossed that one out, but we got it out anyway. <laughs> Luke 18, 10. See, I, I don't know. I just, I got this thing in me. And I feel it really big this morning. I just want us to be real. I, I just want us to be real. So much phoniness in the world, and it shouldn't be us. Yeah. 
Verse 9, Luke 18, 9, he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves and were confident that they were righteous, that they were upright and in right standing with God, and scorned and made nothing of all the rest of men. Here's an example. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, who was a religious man, and one a tax collector who was supposed to be the worst of the worst. The Pharisee took his stand ostentatiously. But the tax collector, the sinner, merely stood at a distance without even lifting up his eyes to heaven. And he kept striking his breast and saying, oh God, be favorable to me. Be merciful to me, an especially wicked sinner. Verse 14, I tell you that this man went down to his home justified, forgiven, and made upright and in right standing with God. Rather than the other man, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Somebody give God a praise. Now, we have the deceitfulness of riches, and boy, that's a big one, but you know something that's very interesting to think about is that it's not just rich people that are deceived by riches. As a matter of fact, there's poor people who have money and things on their mind a whole lot more <laughs> than people who have stuff. And Dallas Willard said this, and I thought it was good. Freedom from possessions is not so much an outward thing as it is an inward thing. Here's the bottom line. God does, he wants you to be blessed and have things. And I don't think he really cares how many of them you have. I mean, he's pretty rich. But he doesn't want them to have us in any way at all. Therefore, we are tested on a regular basis and God will put it on our heart to pass something on and to be a steward instead of an owner. You know, we don't need to be attached to our stuff. I mean, we got it from God. He don't care how much it you have if you could be a steward and not an owner. And let's see, do I have anything else I want to annoy you with before I'm done? <laughs> oh, one left. <laughs> the deceitfulness of sin. Hmm. Hebrews 3.13 said, warn people against the deceitfulness of sin. So I'm warning you that sin can be very deceitful. It makes you think it's going to make you happy. But it won't. See, there's actually instructions to the people to warn people that you teach. People today aren't too crazy about that, but it's what the Bible says. Not just encourage, but also warn. If you do this, this is what's going to happen. And so, first of all, sin promises satisfaction, and then it destroys us. Sin will always cost you more than you intended to pay. Sin promises freedom, but in fact, it produces bondage. Now watch. One person thinks, I want to be free to drink all the alcohol I want. They soon find out that they are no longer free not to drink all the alcohol they want. You didn't get it, did you? See, if I want to go out and, and drink, then... I'm going to go out and drink. And if I want to get drunk, I'm going to get drunk. I'm a free person. And I'm, I'm not going to be a Christian yet because I want to be able to do everything that I want to do. I mean, really? Is that really what you want to do? And so they think they're free to drink, but ultimately, many of them are then no longer free not to drink. Are the same way with drugs. You know, a young person thinks, I'm just going to try that, you know. Everybody does it. I'm just going to try that. I'm free to do that. And then pretty soon they find out they're no longer free not to do that. Now, all of a sudden, that's become a bondage in their life. We have to please be careful about flirting with sin. 
Nobody wakes up some morning that's married and is in a full-blown affair with somebody that they work with. It happened gradually. Flirting. A coffee. A compliment. A donut. Must have been donuts, I don't know. That, that got some attention. Somebody thinks, well, I want to be free to have sex with women other than my wife. But if I'm a Christian, I can't do all the things I want to do. And soon that person who does that finds that he has lost the love and the respect of his wife and children, mother and father, sister and brother, friends, and all the other women have now moved on to destroy somebody else's family. I'm going to say it anyway. See, let me tell you something. Please understand this. And you know, the great thing about TV is you can turn me off anytime you want to. I mean, these poor folks, they can't get out of the building yet. But if you don't like this, you can turn it off but you'll find me again somewhere else if you flip your channels around. <laughs> I'll be there in the middle of the night. And I am not just doing this for something fun to do. I believe that if we are going to preach and teach people that we are obligated before God to not just pat them on the head and tell them nothing but you're wonderful and God loves you, that is all true, but he also calls us to a higher standard of living. Yeah. Don't just live for this one emotional moment. <laughs> Later on, it's gonna come. And then we have to deal with the aftermath. People say, well, the price of discipleship is too high. I read books from some of these old writers when I mean people were after holiness with their whole heart. They were after God, I mean, with their whole hearts. I mean, that, that was it. It wasn't a Sunday morning event. It was, it, this is my life. And they talk about the cost of discipleship and the price of really following God. And I've paid a price to do what I'm doing. I mean, I lost friends. I got asked to leave my church. I just, you know, you get, well, I don't even want to go into it. But, but man, okay, so the price for discipleship is high. But let me just end by saying, I think that the price we pay for a lack of discipleship is even higher. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, I sure hope that today's teaching has given you a better understanding of how God's truth defeats every lie the enemy would like for you to believe about yourself and your life. Let's remember John 8:31 31 and 32. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. This community likes boys, so they want their boys to go to school first. The girls, they don't have any, any value when it comes to education for them. So if they can get some money for her and not have the burden of having to care for her, it helps the family. The flags that you see on the homes over my shoulder represent a long-standing tradition that is very difficult on girls. As soon as a very young girl reaches puberty and she's of childbearing years, you'll see these flags above their houses representing the fact that a young girl is available to a man, essentially on the market, up for sale, 
And at that point, her life changes dramatically. So what they do is they take him out of school and they'll actually go through different activities, teaching them how to cook, how to be a, a wife in the, in the home. But part of it is also how to please a man. And that's through, you know, normal things in the house, but also sexually. So they teach them different things about sexuality and so on. So we are doing anything that we can to help people understand the value of girls. That's the key. And helping these girls by taking them into a program <laughs> called Imagine Hope. Because it's that small. If they would live with us for six months and we would have devotions, lead them to the Lord, really mentor them in how to be a godly woman, and then at the same time teach them how to do some skills, basic things like jewelry making or whatever it is that they can have some kind of an income that they can bring to their families. This is a good hat. Were you afraid when you thought that you were going to have to be married? Some of my friends, they are already married now, but they are used to suffer in that marriage. So if myself, I was afraid to be married while I'm still young, but because of this program, my mom, she didn't take me to the marriage, but she bring me here so that I can proceed with my education, so that I can help her in future, change her situation. I, I'm so grateful. I wish I could bring everyone here and let them see the impact of what's happening. Um, and I'm grateful for it because we should give and we should give to those that we don't benefit us. And I think that's what Hand of Hope does and, and we're grateful for that. We are helping young women like this all over the world. Help us to guide, restore, and love young girls. Your designated gift today, if you choose, can go to Project Girl, or you can give toward water, you can give toward feeding, and do something that you know will make a difference.